My name is Molly Aitken, and this is a short story, Pomegranate Flesh, which is a retelling of the myth of Eros and Psyche. Imagine you are standing on a staircase. From below, you can smell burnt pork fat, and from above wafts the scent of sun-warmed peaches. The sound of tinkling cutlery, a dinner party, enticing you, but you cannot go up before you go down. You are Psyche, our mortal, who loves the goddess with sharpened fingernails, feathery jumpers, and a smile dripping mischief. Erica is your girlfriend, and you would die for her. You cannot understand why she is with you. She is that effortless kind of beautiful, short, elf-like, and pear-shaped. Most days, she casually eats a donut with breakfast and drinks beer with dinner. You are not like her. You are long and tall. You already take up too much space on the sofa. She told you so once. On the television, you both watched an actress who used to be ageless, but now is getting long in the tooth, Erica says. Look at her hands. You can always tell from the hands. Erica ordered a pizza in, as she doesn't like you to go out. You're weak these days, she says. The stairs would be too difficult. And as always, she is right. You ate a slice of the pizza. Chorizo oil coated your mouth in bliss, and in the bathroom after, the vomit burned. You peeled off your clothes and scrutinized yourself in the mirror. You were glad to see your narrowness, how your sharp limbs and shrinking torso have almost vanished. But did all this happen days ago? Time has become more fluid since you stopped eating. But she tells you every day, you're beautiful and you lived for those words, even though you didn't believe them. You, Psyche, are a forgotten myth a cutesy child who appears in the paintings that hang in hotel lobbies, a baby cherub, shallow and perfect. You are 20 now, growing older. You've read Jane Austen and watched too many Disney films. You relate to Belle in Beauty of the Beast, but that kind of role model can get a girl killed. Now you stand on the stairs, your bare toes hanging over the abyss. It's dark and you wonder if the whole light is broken again. Your chest feels like it's bursting. You're lightheaded. You do not leap, but simply step forward. Some would say you are too young to fall, but some have failed to equip you. There are not enough sterilized fairy tales in the world to prepare a child to survive in houses that aren't palaces or woodland cottages. You go down smiling, falling, and land in a heap of bones at the bottom, but it is almost painless. Your bones are so light, they snap like breadsticks. A black river licks your fingernails. A boat bobs ahead and you find you are somehow, even with your broken body, climbing into it. You pour half your purse's contents into the ferryman's outstretched palm, saving the rest for the journey home. After all, you've learned a little from the books you read. On the opposite bank, you crawl out of the raft and find yourself nose to nose with a skeletal dog you remember the packet of digestive biscuits you found in Erica's cupboard. There is one in your purse and you throw it into the dog's gaping mouth. Your own mouth aches with jealousy and you wish you'd stolen more. The dog's bark sounds like Erica's screams. You are faint now. Your nose burns with the smell of roasting pork. You reach your destination and crumple at the dead queen's feet. Her toenails are painted with blood. Will you fill my purse with beauty, you say. Your purse is cheap. 
one you picked up in Primark, lined with faux fur. You could have sworn there had been a few pounds left, but it's empty. I need your beauty for my future, you say. Persephone smiles, spittle clinging to her bottom lip. What makes you think you have a future, she asks. I have Erica, you say, but wonder if it's true or if she even matters. Your memories are turning misty gray. You wait for the dead queen to pour her beauty into your unzipped purse, but she just stares at you, judges you, taking in every sharp angle of you and you want to vanish. You curl up, fetal, on the floor. You feel you are shrinking. You will just stay here at the bottom of the stairs and sleep until you are a pile of dust. Get up, she says. She takes your hand and plops a plump, weighty pomegranate into it. Eat, she says. You press it to your nose and its aroma is sugared sunshine. The above. You are so tired, but your lips are flaking, your tongue dry, so you take a bite, prepared for the bright, sparkling taste of fruit. But you gag. Your mouth is coated in a flavor like raw meat. How do you taste? Persephone asks. The fruit is bloody, and somehow you know it is your own flesh you have torn with your teeth. You are drifting in a fog, and for a moment, you think you see Erica bent over you, mouth open wide like she is screaming, but you hear nothing. Your chest throbs with low, bright pain, like a toothache. Nothing lasts forever, Persephone says. You do, you reply. Yes, but I am nothing. And you see how thin she is, fading, fading into the dark. Eat, her voice tells you, and you do. You push the meaty fruit into your mouth and swallow again and again, and gradually it gets sweeter. You look down and your limbs are filling out. Somewhere high above, you see the dead queen smile. You want to climb up after her, and then you realize you are floating, no flying, in Erica's arms. She carries you not up the stairs, but out towards a blue flashing light. You wonder briefly if she will kiss you like a prince in a fairy tale. You shut your eyes and wait, but a tube is pushed down your throat. You sleep, and when you wake, hungry, in the white of the hospital ward, Erica clasping your fingers, you remember everything. Now, in the hospital, you order a pizza with extra pepperoni. <laughs>